wisdom today. Hi, we're live at Sifta for Coffee and Kabbalah. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining in person, live, watching afterwards. It is Rosh Chodesh Cheshvan, um, and we're going to talk about Parsha Noach and a little bit about the month of Cheshvan. Um, who's been here for a Cheshvan class? Scorpio, Cheshvan. Oh, man. Probably me. Okay, great. So you guys will help me out. Okay, so we have two source sheets in front of us. One is on the month of Cheshvan. One is on the um, the month of uh, the sources for Noah. So I'll do a little bit of a background on Cheshvan, but I'm not going to get so into it today because I want to. We missed the Parsha last week. We missed 1500. We skipped 1500 years of Parsha, and I don't know how to make it up. I was just thinking we have to have two classes today to make it up. But we so we were fast forwarding from creation last week, 1500 years later about um, to Parsha's Noah. Um, it's a lot to cover, and and then yeah, we just missed that. Okay, so the, every month we learn, um, there's more than just a different month of the year. We, every month we go through the different Kabbalistic energies of the month based on the Sefer Yitzira and um, many other um, Jewish sources. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit. Obviously, the name of the month is Cheshvan. Some call it Mar Cheshvan, which means bitter. It's a Cheshvan. There's no Chagim in this holiday, right? We, had, we kind of have a break right now. Um, following the theme we've been talking about, right? We've been saying that we've, Elul was a time to reconnect and date Hashem again and get to know Hashem, get to know our relationship again. Then Rosh Hashanah was the proposal from Hashem, right? And we blow the shofar and say yes. And then Yom Kippur is our intimacy with Hashem. And Sukkot, we celebrated that love and connection with seven days of Shavu Brachos, of having time away from everything just to be with our beloved. Cheshvan is like when real life starts again, when you get to like step out after the wedding, after the celebrations, and now you get to have true intimacy. And while it seems like a lot of people have a low, and that's why it's called Mar Cheshvan, a lot of depression sets in because you have sometimes. Um, because first of all, you're going from this high of like Chagim and family and festivities and you're rejoicing with Hashem to nothing for a month, nothing to look forward to for a month. But it also is a much more meaningful connection because instead of being externalized and being all about the external and the fanfare and the parties, right, we get to have a real life connection and connect in the details of the day to day life, in the real moments of life. And this is a chance to turn all of that love into something real, into the day to day, into testing it in real life and being able to connect and just have a month without pauses, right? To really focus on connecting, on being real, on being present with what real life is all about, right? So we really get to have a month right now of uninterrupted real life. I love it, right? When I was, when you're a kid, like you miss the, you miss all the holidays and the excitement. And when you're a parent, you're like a month to breathe, right? Before like the chaos starts again. So it's a month to breathe. And that's actually what the inner, um, every month has a sense. We learn in Kabbalah that there's more than five senses. Every month we tap into a sense more than um, that sense is heightened and we can work on that sense and connect to that sense in our bodily sense more than any other month. And in this month, it's a sense of smell. So it's one of the five senses. Um, and smell is connected to breath, right? So it's a time to exhale, to breathe, to smell things deeper. Scheshvan, um, a lot of times people have a nefila, um, which is interesting because every, so every month has a name of the month. It has a letter of the Aleph base that the Chayas, the energy of the month comes through. There's a different permutation of Hashem's four letter name, a different order of how Hashem's name Yodei Vavhe is channeling the light in our month. There's a bodily sense of the month. There's a zodiac sign of the month. And this month it's Scorpio. There's also um, a plan of the month that we sometimes discuss. There is a one of the uh, four elements is connected to each month, right? Where there's three months for each element. And this element, this month, anyone know the element of Scorpio? Earth, air, fire, water? water. It's a water sign, right? And also Scorpios grow in water. So it's a water sign, um, very water sign. Um, so there's also, and there's also 12 Shvatim, which are each connected to one for each month. And in this month, it is Shevet Menashe, um, the tribe of Menashe. Um, which is not really one of the 12 sons. It's a grandson of Yaakov, but he's one of the 12 tribes. <laughs> okay. So let us, let's just dive in a little bit into a few of the general ideas of the month. So historically, there's not even, there's nothing in this month. Even more, we said in Av, there's no Chagim, but in Av, there's Tisha B'Av, then there's Tu B'Av. There's not even Tisha B'Av. There's not even a fast day in this month, right? Um, it's an empty month, and it's said, and it's brought down in Kabbalah that Hashem saved this month for Mashiach. Um, so this Cheshvan was set aside, nothing else in it to save the entire month for Mashiach to come. So it's a month that's very much connected to Mashiach. Um, it's a month connected to water, also because it's a water sign, also because it's the month that rain begins. Um, it's also a time when things start to get cold, and that's why depression, sometimes there's Mar, sometimes sets in in Cheshvan, when you're not going out as much. Because it's starting to get cold, you're hibernating more inside, you're not getting to see people as much, so sometimes you get more inwards, we start to go inwards in this month. Um, but it's not a depressive month, it's a time when it's connected to water, which is flourishing, prosperity, right? Growth. So it's a time to really, truly grow from an inner place. Um, what did happen historically in this month is on the 7th of Cheshvan, we begin to pray for rain, right? We start the brachas of davening for rain. Then on Yud Zayin Cheshvan, oh man, how do I just, um, let me just, let me just 
do not disturb me. Um, on the 17th, anyone know what happened on Yudzayim Cheshvan? The flood began, the Mabel, the Mabel began on the 17th of Cheshvan, a long time ago. Um, and on the 27th day, the flood ended, the next year, one year and 10 days later. I thought it was exactly one year, so I have to challenge my, my notes. I'm pretty, it was thir well, exactly one year when the land dried up, when he left the Teva. So I don't really have to challenge it. Okay, so the number of the month also, every month has a number from Nisan. So Nisan, Ir, Sivan, Tamos, of Elul Tishrei Cheshvan. This letter, the number of this month is number eight, which is also connected to Mashiach, because it says that David's harp will have eight strings in the time of Mashiach, because Mashiach is a time of eight, which is beyond nature, and the rest of the time of Galos is within nature, which is within the seven. Um, the sign is the Scorpio, um, the which we won't talk about so much today, but we do know that it's connected to, um, oh, it's, the Mei Saskar says that Scorpio in Hebrew, anyone know? A krav, right? Um, a krav in it's in English is the Cancer, the month of Cancer. Um, no. Oh, Scorpio! I don't know why I just said that. That's a different water sign because uh, that's the crab, right? Um, thank you. And in this, the Nei says the akrav could be ikar bays or ikar bayit, um, which is the main house because he says that the ikar of the bayit, the main house, the third base of Mikdash will be rebuilt in Cheshvan. Um, there's a lot of places that can to Cheshvan being connected to Mashiach, and one of them is in the sense of smell. That says the Mashiach will be judging through his smell. Smell is the most refined of all the senses. In last week's Parsha, when the Eitz Adas contaminated all of the four of the five senses besides smell, it says it says clearly in the Pesukim that Chava saw the 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 fruit of the tree and it was tempting to her. She tasted it, she felt it, and touched it, um, and she heard the snake telling her what to do. So all of them were contaminated by sin besides smell, which is much more refined and is connected to our neshama. Our neshama. And we actually see that in breath. And when we take a deep breath, it's called in Hebrew a neshima, which is connected to our soul or neshama. So the sense of smell is the most connected to our soul, and that's why by Abdullah we smell because it comforts our soul when our second additional soul is leaving. So it's, a, it's the only smell that can connect to our soul. The smell is also connected to this week's parsha because the smell is said to bring um, nachas to Hashem, to bring the smell of the karbanos. It says to bring a nachas ruach, a pleasure to Hashem. The smell brings a lot of pleasure, and this week's parsha is the first time we see that someone brought a. The, in the psukim, that the smell of the carbon brought pleasure to Hashem. Let me bring it in my notes. Um, oh my gosh, I didn't bring my chomesh, Jorah. Do you have a chitas? Um, I, I have the chitas. Thank you so. I might have oh my. Um, I forgot to print my sources. Would I bring more of the ones that I just read to you? I have it on the phone. No, no, no. I, I need a chomesh. Oh my gosh. Anyways, it says that Noah, after living the Teva, immediately what he did is he took sacrifices of all the kosher animals and made a new bris. There was a new covenant made with Hashem. Um, and in that in that um, carbon, there was a, ple a pleasurable smell to Hashem and that calmed Hashem down. And the pleasurable smell, we actually read it in the carbonos every day. It's called a reach nichoach, right? The, that, we, that Hashem receives from the carbonos, a pleasurable reach, a smell. And that's connected to the word Noah, because Noah is comfort. So it's a comforting smell. So through our smell, we receive comfort we're taking deep breaths and smelling, you know, the, the godliness in the air, um, we receive comfort. So it's a time to take a deep breath, a pause, and connect to breathing, to smelling, to sensing. One other place that smell is connected to Mashiach that I'll mention for today is that it says that Mashiach will judge through his smell. That they had, um, um, there was a time, and I mentioned this at length last year, there was a false Mashiach. There was a time when even Rabbi Akiva rallied behind our Kochba, that he was the Mashiach. He said that he was Mashiach. He fought wars against the against the Romans, the rebels, and they and he said he's going to build the base Mikdash. And everyone believed he was the Mashiach. Rabbi Akiva did as well, and the Chachamim were split. And many of the Chachamim started to suspect that he wasn't the Mashiach. So how did they test him? Thank you so much. Um, it says that they tested him through a smell. That Mashiach will be able to judge everyone and know which tribe they're from, which lineage they're from, with their Kohen Levi Israel, everything about them through smelling. He'll be able to smell their soul and where their soul comes from. This is not new in Judaism, right? We see a lot of places where Yaakov came in, um, when Yaakov and Esau came in and Yitzhak smelled the smell on Yaakov, right? And smelled like Gan Eden. So you can smell something spiritual. So um, the, the Chachamim took this person who said he's Mashiach and brought before him different Jews and saw if he can smell who, where their lineage was from. And he failed the smell test. And later he was declared as a false messiah and he was killed by the Romans. They, gave, they handed him over to the Romans to be killed because he led many, many Jews astray. He caused many people to have, to, it was terrible, terrible outcomes from that. But the way they test him to see if he can smell. So we learned that when Mashiach comes, he'll be able to sniff all of us. So like bring your deodorant when Mashiach comes. So you're going to be sniffed. I mean, I guess to smell everything. So there's a very spiritual sense. So Cheshvan is a time to um, have Mashiach.
<laughs> Thank you for the source. Okay, so that's Menasha. Hmm, I really want to get into Menasha, Moshe. If we have time, um, we'll get more into the month. That's just a little bit about the energy of what we're doing. So what we're going on in this month is a month of breathing, a month of connecting to our smell, a month of connecting to our soul, <laughs> and of um, um, leaning into the water, which we'll talk about what the water is in this month. So water, the it's not just a water sign. It's like the water of all water, right? It's the time of the, the water begins. The whole month was a flood. Um, we also dive in for rain. So we're very much connected to water and rain. And we're going to talk about the rainbow today as well. Holds me to it. Of course. Um, it reminded me of something from the holiday that was interesting. So all the, the trees in the Garden of Eden um, were trees that had both smell and the bark also had like a purpose. Like it was a whole tree was useful. Same thing with the, um, the Eshel. And it's the only one that didn't betray, it says in the, in the stories that this is why we use the Eshel right and so it's interesting the right smell issue right really interesting right it also connects us to sukkahs i guess right. with the smelling right. um the letter of the month is nun i just said i would mention it um nun could either be the nun or no felet because it says um in in ashray we go through all the letters of the alphabet and it says so hashem the call no flim so their nun is the one that falls so it's a time sometimes when people feel a fall in khajban because there's nothing spiritual to pull you upwards there's none of the highs that pull you and inspire you so sometimes people feel a fall but nevertheless, it says that Nun is also the name of Nisim. And we can transform that fall into tremendous miracles. And Nun is also, it says that it's Mashiach's name. Um, Nun is Niflaot. Right now we're in Tavshin. Never mind. Okay, but no, no, never, never mind. Yes, Begimel. Um, but it says, it's brought down in Tehillim that Hashem Shemo Olam Lifnei Shemesh Yunun or Nun Shemo. That it says that Mashiach, the time of Mashiach will be Nun is his name. Nun, Mashiach will be um, a long Nun, represents Mashiach. And then this month is specifically a Nun and a long Nun. So it's taking that small Nun or the regular Nun and tr tr bringing it down into the ordinary days of our life, into the physicality of our lives, into the regular day-to-day -day mundane things and drawing down godliness there. That is what is one of the messages of this month. Anyways, I can't, I can't spend more time on this. Okay, let's dump into, um, oh, I wish I could, um, into the Parsha, because we really have to catch up, right? So Hashem creates the world. Um, there's a man and a woman. They have two sons, Kain and Hevel. And then we fast forward, right? And the end of last week's Parsha, Noah is born. And 10 generations after the world is created, about 1,500 years, Hashem looks and it says the world has been corrupted. Okay, so now here we are when Hashem begins this Parsha and tells um, Noah that he's going to destroy. Hashem regrets creating the entire world. He says, I messed up, right? Clearly I did something wrong. If only 10 generations in, the whole earth is corrupted. Not just the people, but they corrupted the earth itself. Um, the earth, the animals, the land itself, the whole world I created has been corrupted. Hashem said, I, I have to reboot, right? Control, alt, delete, restart. And Hashem says, I'm going to destroy the world. I'm not going to destroy it completely, but I'm going to save a certain, um, the righteous ones so they can restart the world from them. So there's going to be an ark. Um, and the reason, and Hashem tells Noah, I want to give everyone a chance to get aboard the ark. Anyone who wants to come on the ark, come on. Um, give them a chance to do shuvah. So Hashem commands Moshe, says, Noah, to take you and your family, build this ark. It takes 120 years to build this. Bring one of, two of every non-kosher species onto the ark. Seven of every kosher um, species onto the ark. Um, so it has to be giant, right? Because we know how many species there are. Um, it takes 120 years to build it. And then Hashem tells Noah to keep warning the people, to do it in public and to warn the people that there's going to be a flood. They could seal the teshuva and they could come on the ark. Um, but no one believes him. Even Noah, we learned, doesn't 100% know if it's actually going to happen the way Hashem says it. And there is a, a rain begins to fall and it ends up covering the entire earth. It says that the rain covered the tops of the mountains. The Mount every the highest mountain, Mount Everest, was covered. The waters from below remet the waters from above. Okay, so let's look inside a little bit. And we're gonna talk today about why this had to happen. So we understand that Hashem wants to reboot and restart the world because it's not working with his intended plan. His intended plan was to have a world, right, where physicality can connect to godliness, where there can be a fusion, right? And that's what we had at Matan Torah, where we can have a world that the physicality can reflect and absorb and connect to godliness. And there can be a relationship with an other. And that wasn't working, right? And it, there was, it was completely corrupted. The people were doing horrible, terrible things. So if Hashem wants to restart the world, we ask, why not just, why, have, why a flood? Why 40 days? Right? There's so many other ways. Like in Makas Bechoros, it happened in an instant. Right? Shem said the, ma, ma, the, ma, um, the plague is going to come. And every firstborn died on the spot immediately. Right? There's many plagues over history where Hashem immediately made a plague and everyone just died. Right? Why did it have to be so gradual? Why did it have to be through water? 
through so much. It took so much effort, right? It's a lot of wasted water, right? Um, why, why, what's the deeper intention in making it specifically a flood? And the easiest way to destroy the world would be because we learned last week in Bereshis that the way Hashem creates the world is a continuous creation, that the world, in order for it to continue existing, it says that the Maimaros, the 10 Maimaros that Hashem said to create the world have to continuously be said to sustain the creation of the world. And were Hashem to stop saying the words, for example, Yehirakia, then the whole sky would stop to exist as if it never existed. So if Hashem wants to destroy the world, he could just stop saying that Tzar Marmaro, so he said last, and began saying right in last Parsha, and then the world will cease to exist. Why this whole long effort? So you might say it was to convince them to do Teshuvah, right? To give them that opportunity. But still, why not just bring an instant flash flood, everyone dies, right? Why drag it out for so long? Um, and why water? So we learn actually from Chassidus and from many, many Mepharshim that the flood was not just a punishment. There was a lot more depth to um, what was going on. It wasn't just a way to destroy the world and restart. There was a lot more inner significance to what the flood was and what the water represented and what the flood represented. Why can't I just find the Parsha? Okay. Um, we also want to understand why the water had to cover the mountains, right? The people died already when the water reached, you know, like higher than the than the highest building they could stand on, right? Why reach the top of the mountains? Why did it have to be that high? There were so many details about it that are brought down in the Sukkim that teach us that there's a lot more significance to what's going on. Um, let me just look in the Sukkim to see when the... It says that the windows of the heavens opened. That the... the we'll to him, there was windows in the heaven that hold back the rain, for example, and the, and the windows opened and released the water. Like, it just flooded downwards. It wasn't just a trickle. Eventually, then it says, So even after the 40 days and 40 nights of the water coming down, there was another 150 days where the water was still um, on the earth. The earth was still flooded for till the water went down. Then um, even longer until So this is exactly one year later when the when the Teva landed on the mountain. So even though there was 150 days and then until it could actually land, on which mountain? On Har Ararat. That's when it happened exactly one year later when the Teva hit dry land. Um, but then he didn't come out right away, right? Because it took a while for him to to um, get out of the Teva. <laughs> um, okay, so then it says that the um, until the 10th month, which is Kislev Teves, I guess, um, on the 10th of the day, that's when they began to see the mountaintops. I know, that's weird. It says the 10th month, on the first day. Um, and then he looked out of it. Okay, I'm not going to go into the history right now because I have it all written down, but it's that we can't get it from the Psukim. Um, they go back and forth, and we have to look at Mepharshim to understand exactly the days. But if anyone else can fill in, please fill in for me. Um, but we do know that he sent out the dove three times. Um, he sent out the raven. The raven never came back. He sent out the dove. And finally, the dove came back with an olive branch. Um, and then, okay, let's go right in. So, okay, this is really amazing. There's a Medrash Rabbah on Bereshis that teaches us what's going on here in the waters. And we learn that the before the world was created, the entire earth, it says, The earth was chaos. The whole world was chaos. And we learned that all there was was water. When Hashem made the world, there was only water. There was an entire orb of world submerged in water. Imagine our earth submerged in an entire, in a, in an entire um, thing of water. And Hashem's spirit is resting above the water. And we learned that on the second day of creation, Hashem split the waters. And what does that mean? Everything was water and he moved apart the waters, right? We know this, right? The water split on the second day. Well, some of the waters became the heavens. Some of the waters became the oceans, but there was still no earth. There was just space in between, right? Thank you so much. Then on the third day, dry land appeared. Hashem rem um, lifted up the dry land. So the rest, the, the opinion of, how, of the creation of the world, the way we're supposed to learn it, is that everything existed. On the first day of creation, it says, Bereshus bar lo Hashem created everything. He created the entire world with everything in it, with all the potential for animals, with the sun, moon, and stars. However, nothing was in place. Then on the first day, Hashem separated light, light and dark. Then Hashem separated the waters. And then the earth emerged from the waters on the third day. Then Hashem um, sprouted the seed, the plants, which were already... And then Hashem on the fourth day 
put the sun, moon, and stars in their place because everything was just chaos and confused and mixed up within each other. And Hashem put each thing in its place in each of the seven days of creation. That's just a side note. So now we have, we actually brought, it's brought down in the Medrash in that until the third day of creation, um, when Hashem brought for a dry land, there wasn't the potential for um, any otherness to exist. There wasn't the potential for anything because everything was still water. And water is something that unites everything. Water is um, a connecting, is a connection. And how do we see this? We see that there's two, we learn that there's, um, in spirituality, there's the hidden world and the revealed world. And the hidden world is represented in this world by the ocean. We learn that every species on the earth are reflect, have, we have um, in the ocean, and they're seeing it now more than ever. If you check out, there's like so many Netflix shows about exploring the depths of the ocean. Elephants, every simple type of animal that we have, they found um, a parallel in the ocean. Now, why is the ocean called the revealed world and the hidden world, sorry, and our world, the revealed world? Am I mixing it up? Um, but we right, we can't see anything, but the, yes, but the ocean represents um, that everything in the ocean is connected to each other. You can see that they're all one because the water that they swim in unites all of them, right? We're all in the same exact ocean. And then the earth, we don't get to see our connection. We also see their connection to the air that they breathe, right? They live off of the water. We see their connection to their source. And in the earth, there's a lot of distance from that. There's no connection. We don't get to see that we're all connected by this air that's around us, right? We seem completely separate and fragmented. Um, and the water is something that unites us and absorbs us. So we learn actually that the Medrash teaches that the Shem moved aside the waters to make room for land in order that there can be a world of separateness where, where things can exist because in the water, there's no such thing as separateness. Everything is still included in its source. There's still one with their source. And in order for there to be a true relationship, you have to be a separate, you have to be a separateness, right? If you're one with my child is still in the womb, which is what the world was connected to create, um, um, symbolized before when it was all submerged in the water it was submerged in this godly like womb in the womb of god um there's no otherness the baby is a part of me i can't ever it's, you can't connect to somebody when they're still connected to you right you have to cut the cord at some point in order for there to be an otherness in order for it to be a true connection so that otherness only happened on the third day when the dry land emerged now hashem fast forward looked at the world 10 generations later the world became so corrupt and the measure says that hashem regretted creating the world and said i, I have to start this again this is not going to work um, it, the Medrash brings down an example of a king who had servants who were only deaf and mute, who's, who served him and sang praises to him. And then, um, then he helped them learn how to speak. Then he found, um, he helped them learn how to speak and hear. And then they began to rebel. So he said, let me bring them back to how they were. So Shem says, before I, before the world became a separate ex existence, when everything was submerged in water, it said, it's brought down that everything saved, saying glory to Hashem, that everything was subservient to Hashem. And we all were one with Hashem. We were one with the creation of Hashem. And after I made the separateness and created the dry land, they've corrupted the earth itself. The earth itself became corrupt. The earth wouldn't work. They couldn't work the land. Um, and so Hashem regretted creating it. And Hashem said, I'm going to return the world back to its primordial state before the water is separated and return the earth into my womb again. So I'm going to bring back. So we actually went back into this being encompassed. It wasn't like, let me destroy the world. It's let me bring them back in because I let them, you know, I, I, I gave them that space and look what happened. The world became corrupt. I have to return the earth back to the state of being encompassed in water, which represents connection to the source, right? When you're in water, you're connected, you feel the source. Um, so it, 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 there's a lot of symbolism here. It, there's a symbolism of the womb, of being connected. When a child is in the womb, they're receiving nourishment. They feel that they're receiving nourishment directly from their source, right? They're feeling where the nourishment is coming from. They don't have to think about it. They're being carried, right? They have no independence at all. They can't do anything for themselves. That's why a fetus is, has no, there's a lot said in, in, in place about the fetus. Anyways, and there's also a lot of symbolism here to the um, mikvah, to a mikvah. So the Hasidus takes us even further, and many of the Mepharshim say that the destruction of the, of the world wasn't Hashem saying, I want to destroy everybody, I'm angry, let me destroy the world and start again, like, like later on when Hashem was angry at the Jewish people, right? And he said, I want to destroy everyone besides you, Moshe. And Moshe said, you know, take me too. This was an act of Hashem saying, I, I need to start this again and do it differently because the, something's not working about the way I did it. And I'm going to bring everyone back to where it was working, back into this fold, being connected to their source. So Hashem resubmerged, it says, in the world into an entire cosmic mikvah, a womb-like mikvah. And I'm a Kala teacher and a Balani. And one thing that I, that I really connect to that I learned a couple of years ago was that the mikvah, for me, one of my intentions is understanding that when I'm in the mikvah, feeling like I'm in Hashem's womb feeling like I'm being held, like completely submerged in this womb of Hashem, being connected. The, the waters are the purifying waters, the holy waters. They're, it's feeling like Hashem is just carrying me. And I'm just like a fetus being carried and cared for and sustained and held by, you know, by my maker, just taking care of all of my needs. So it's a time of bitzel because tevila and dipping um, as it shares the same letters as the word bitzel, which means 
letting go. Bittal means I'm not, I'm nothing. I'm just being carried by another and taking away all sense of, of myself and just being able to let go. And that's really, so, so Mick, what I'm trying to say is that the, ma, the Mabo was more than just a destructive force. <laughs> it was also to destroy the people because they didn't have the ability to do Teshuvah and come back. But much, much more than that, it was a cosmic mikvah dip. It was Hashem taking the entire world and dunking it in a mikvah to purify it so that it could now become a new world, so that the new world could emerge from this. And we see this in so many ways. First of all, now we understand why Hashem destroyed the world through water, because water is transformative. Water is connecting. Water is when you feel carried and connected to the source of your life. We understand now why it's 40 days. Anyone know what the connection between mikvah and 40? Albeim sa. Oh, you're also a balanit. Um, a mikvah, the minimum measurement of water that has to be in a mikvah is 40 sa'a. And that represents why the, mik why the mabba was 40 days and 40 nights. Because it's enough for me as one person, for you to, to submerse in the mikvah 40 sa'a. But for the entire world to be dunked at the same time into the mikvah, there has to be much more than 40 sa'a, 40 days and 40 nights. Now, what is unique about the number 40 in Judaism, right? Does that number 40 ring a bell? 40 holds a lot of symbolism. 40 is a number of transformation. It's not just random, oh, the mikvah is 40 sa'a. The 40 is a number of transformation. Where else do we see 40? Moshe ascending to receive the Torah for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, where else do we see the number 40? 40 years, in the, 40 years in the desert for the Jewish nation to become a nation from an enslaved nation to a nation ready to go to Eretz Yisrael. It took 40 years for that process. And also for a fetus, we learned that there's 40 days for the fetus to become from a, a fetus into like an, from an embryo into a fetus. <laughs> um, also, there's things about that say 40 days before a child is born, right? There's a lot with a symbol. Uh, oh, 40 weeks of pregnancy, right? To transform to being a human. Thank you. I knew there was something I forgot. So 40 is a number of transformation. So it wasn't uh, just a God, uh, you know, God unleashing his fury. Hashem was taking the world and saying the world as it is, is too corrupt. We learned that the... They, they couldn't even work the land. The people weren't able to work the land and grow anything because the land itself had become so hardened and coarse and it wasn't workable. And that's why Noah was named Noah because he brought manucha and comfort to the world because he was the first person to invent the fork, a fork to eat with and a fork to work the land with, to be able to try and work the land. But the land was earth contaminated. The land had become earth itself. So it wasn't just that Hashem had to purify the people. The whole world had to be submerged. And that explains to us why the Pasuk mentions to us that the water covered even the highest mountaintop. And that's why when the water um, subsided, it says that they began to see the tops of the mountaintops. Because just like a mikvah, um, a dip, the whole reason we have a balani is because oftentimes a woman dips and there's a finger sticking out or there's some hair sticking out, which happens a lot more than you think. Um, and the, the, the idea is, is that submersion has to be total submersion and total immersion and that one is because we want to achieve one is we want to achieve bits. we want to achieve going back, right? If one piece of a baby's out of the womb, it's not good news, right? It's not, it's not very good. So the, the total one is we want to achieve one is so Hashem submerged the entire world in this cosmic mikvah. And what emerged after was a world that may have looked the same, but was intrinsically a completely different world that before they went into the mikvah. And just like when we dip a keli into the mikvah, we have a keli that wasn't kosher, it becomes kosher. Or when a non-Jew goes into the mikvah to convert, they emerge a different person. They're transformed. They might look the same, but they completely transformed. Or a woman who's single emerges in the mikvah, descends into the mikvah, and she emerges, right? A married soul, right? There's something, there's a un, something, an untangible um, but a very real change that emerges from the mikvah and out of this 40-day mikvah emerged an entirely new world that was now capable of um, of 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 um, something of something entirely different, which is why Hashem promised that he'll never do a Abel again, right? How could Hashem promise that? What if we mess up way more than they messed up, which we've seen over the years? Why is Hashem promising never to destroy us the entire world again? What like what Hashem knows how many times we're gonna mess up and the answer is that the before that the dunk, um, the, this, this world, what do we call it? The big dunk, let's call it the big dunk. This big dunk changed everything in the world that there would never be a need for another flood again, to destroy the world again, because the world was too cor coarse before. It, we learned that the world was very megusham. When Hashem made the world, it was too separate. There was too, it was too um, physical. The people were too coarse and they didn't even have the ability to do teshuva. That's why they couldn't do teshuva. There was nothing to penetrate. They were too hard. And it's like, I say the example, when you talk to somebody, you just feel like you can't get through them, right? There's You're wasting your breath sometimes because like a psychopath, right? There's just no one to talk to, right? They, they were psychopathic in a way. There was just nowhere to penetrate. 
and the land itself had become that way and the animals themselves had become that way that there was they had become so hardened um, that the Shabbat said I need to refine the world and that's what a mikvah does it spiritually refined the world the entire world in such a way that from now on even if people would sin to that extent just like we learn in the story of Yonah and the people of Nineveh who were just as corrupt and evil they had the ability to penetrate Teshuvah could, could, they could hear Teshuvah and they could still do Teshuvah there was no ability of teshuva, of receiving godliness, of absorbing, of, of any message hitting them. And after the mikvah, the whole entire world became refined to a state that it was one step closer to Matan Torah. What was caused by Matan Torah was that the entire world can literally absorb the word of God and become godly. And we can use an object that's mundane and make a brach on it. And now it's holy um, and turn something mundane into holy. There was That was one of the biggest steps to getting the world to where Hashem wanted it to be, um, was this giant mikvah dunk. And after that, Hashem promised Noah, how do, what's my promise to you that I'll never do this again? So if you actually look in the text, there's many, um, when you look in the text of after the, the world reemerged from the mikvah, you'll see a lot of hints that show you how, diff how the world had changed from before when Hashem created it originally to now. And I've only found a couple that I'm going to share with you today. But if you, every, if you can really, if you're really analytical, you can cross post a lot of the psukim where it mentions the same species as it did in Bereshit. And you'll see that they're much more edel, which means more refined. Is there a better word for it? More refined, more mizuchach in Hebrew, more pure. pure. They're more receptive, right? Something could be more bendable, more soft. And actually, we, one of the ways we learn it is in the age of the people. Before the flood, people lived many years. And after the flood, they lived less. They were more refined. And that's why they're more sensitive and more affected by the world. Because now they're affected by the godliness. They're affected by what they do. Beforehand, they were so disconnected that they can live forever, even if they were living, right, in a completely disconnected way from their source. <clears throat> so we, we could find a lot of juxta, like juxta, um, juxtapose a lot of the psukim. So I brought two for you the second page of notes i want you to look at the okay so let, let, in the in the noah Mo, no first of all it says Hashem had to command noah to leave the teva because he didn't want to leave the mafarshim have different reasons one was that he never um he didn't want to leave because he was afraid of the flood he didn't want to leave because he didn't want to enter the world he didn't want to have Hashem had to command him to have children because he said i'm not going to bring children into a world that could be destroyed so Hashem had to recommand him to have children but What's interesting, because even though Hashem already commanded um, Adam to have children, right? Hashem recommended Noah, and there's a dif there's a difference in the two commands. So let's read it. It says that by Yom, it was after um, it was after forty days. Noah opens the window. He sees what happened, right? Let's find the commandments um, where Hashem says same in a teva. There, it's Perik Ches, Pasuk Tes Vavei Daber, Elohim Al Noach Leimor, Tsei Min HaTeva, Tav Ishtacha Benecha, Onashe Benecha Itach. Leave the Teva, right? Another reason why you have to command them to to multiply and to have children again is because they weren't allowed to be together. They actually had to have Yichud. They had to be separate. The entire year, they couldn't even be alone in a room together because they weren't allowed to um, have intimacy when the whole world was suffering. <laughs> um, so leave the Teva. Um... And they left, it says, and Noach made them as beach. And here we have the reach nichoach, but Yarach Hashem, and Hashem smelled the pleasant smell. And Hashem said to himself, Lo al kalal odas adam. I will never again curse the earth, bavor adam, on behalf of man. So he won't curse the land itself, because the land was cursed because of the men that corrupted it. Bavor adam, ki yetzer lev adam ramin urav. Because man is just bad <laughs> from their from their childhood. Lo osif od lahakat is called chayka shasis, and I will never again destroy the animals like I did. So Hashem was appeased from the smell. Um, okay, and Hashem blessed them to say, "Puruvu umilat aret," and he told, tell them these these words, right? Um, and then again, in that was pasuk Aleph perak test, and then seven pesukim later in pasuk Zion, "Vatem puruvu." This is not just a bracha that they should be fruitful, giving them their blessing to be together. And again, this was a, a command. And he says, and multiply in it. So let's look in the sources and see that, that there's a slight difference between when Hashem commanded Adam and Hashem commanded Noah. So in Barathees, please tell me I brought it. Is it here? Okay, I'll read you the Pasuk in Barathees. I thought I brought it. <laughs> it's Bracious Perak Aleph Pasuk oh, yeah. So Hashem commands Adam and Chava, or Adam, and what does He say to him? Osam Elokim Pru Uru Milu Aretz Shuha. 
Uredu, Uredu, and rule with God's name of Ofa Shemayim. So what's the difference here? And here, anyone want to read? Uh, what source is it? Yeah. So what's missing in the second account? <coughs> the word keeps shuha. So that tells you a very big difference. Here Hashem is recommanding them to multiply, but he's leaving out the word v'kif shuha, to multiply and fill the world and conquer it. So this tells us something so, so something um, to point out that the world before was tough. It had to be conquered. Adam had to conquer the earth because it was hard. It was coarse. And now that the world has become refined and more um, and more purified, we don't have to conquer the earth anymore, right? We can just work with the earth. And that was that comfort that Noah brought. We can just work with the land. We don't have to fight it. We don't have to fight the earth. We can work with the land. And this is actually how we present spirituality as well. You don't have to fight the things that negate you anymore. We can work with the world, with the world now. The world is not here to stop us, right? The world, we could just work with it and it will, and use it and bring it into the side of holiness. So instead of fighting it, sometimes we're fighting our children, right? And we're like, wait a minute, I don't have to fight you. I can just work with you, right? If my kid is being resistant, I could just laugh with them or joke with them or be silly with them and find a way to work with them if I can break that power struggle, right? So we don't have to have a power struggle with the world anymore because the world is now capable of being worked with, which it wasn't before. That was one one difference of before and after the model that I'm bringing out. The second one is in um, <laughs> Oh, the second one is really interesting. More, um, um, when Hashem commands Adam, he says you could eat all of the vegetation. It's all for you to eat, right? Everything that grows is for you to eat. They were they were commanded to be vegetarian. They were not allowed to eat any. Hashem said every tree right is allowed for you to eat except for the Isadas. But after Noah emerged from the Teva, Hashem switches it. He says all of the earth's vegetation is here for you to eat and all of the animal life, which is kosher, right? Any animal is also for you to eat, but you have to shecht it in a proper way. You can't just eat tear off alive of a living animal. It can't just kill it. You have to kill it in a sensitive way. And he gave them the permission to eat meat. So what changed that before they were had to be vegetarian, now they didn't? So we learn again that to be to eat meat is not just the Torah's perspective on eating meat, and we've discussed this in an entire really different part show it's about meat. It's not just the Torah says eating meat is great. It's eat meat with caution. That if you there is there is something to be gained by eating meat. If you're eating meat and you're able to extract the holy sparks, then you're completing the intention of this animal's soul on earth, right? You're able to if you are coming from a place where you are on a higher level than the animal, where you know that you're not as where you're living a life that's godly, not not an anim, not just living an animalistic you know life that feels good for you. When you're holding yourself to higher standard and you have all the right intentions on kavanos and you're prepared and you're eating exactly right, you're not wasting wasteful. Then something very high can be achieved through eating meat on Shabbat for the right reason right for for holy intentions and holy purposes you can elevate the meat and it could be a very big eloy for the animal and an, an animal's entire intention of being in this world can be elevated but eating meat in a callous way where somebody's on the same level of an animal not only does it not elevate the meat but that person becomes lowered by it and becomes to lower it to the level of the animal so eating meat is something that we can only do when we've elevated to a certain level so only after the flood did humans have the capacity to elevate themselves to refine themselves to a level where they can elevate meat with them and that's why i personally know many people who are very holy people much holier than me who only eat meat on shabbat because on shabbat we know that our souls ascend to a higher world and we're on a higher level and anything we eat on shabbat that's why we're commanded to eat meat and wine on Shabbat because everything that we eat automatically ascends with us even if you're not usually such a holy person even if you're not having all the kavanot so I know people who are very holy Hasidic that only eat meat on Shabbat because then they know that it's being elevated to a higher purpose and even then we're, we, we're not, we have to make sure not to waste meat because who are we right to decide that we're higher than this animal and waste this animal's flesh right so we have to be very intentional in how we eat meat and this capacity only came after the flood when the world was more refined and capable um, we were capable of even extracting and elevating the sparks in the animal and the third change is the rain Rainbow. That's my favorite one to talk about. Okay, so growing up, we love rainbows, right? We were kids and we point at rainbows and they're gorgeous and they're beautiful. And then like some time along, some adult, like a teacher or somebody ruins it and is like, you know, rainbow's a bad sign. And I'm like, why do you have to ruin it for me, right? Rainbows are gorgeous. Like don't ruin rainbows for kids. So I actually found a source a couple years ago that restored the beauty and majesty of rainbows and found the true, like deeper meaning of rainbows and why a rainbow is beautiful to see and why the message is, you know, because the message in the Torah seems to be that the rainbow is a sign that Shem's angry at us and wants to destroy the world. But because of my covenant, I won't destroy it for you. But at the same time, we have a bracha that we say in a rainbow because it's one of the most glorious things that Shem created, right? Um, Zohar Abris, that Shem remembers the promise, Vinaman Libriaso, and he's faithful to his creations. The Kaim Amaro, the Karavarats, Zohar Abris, Vinaman Libriaso, the Kaim Amaro. The caravan, all right, I think. What? 
So Hashem, that he remembers the promise and he won't destroy it. So it's, a, it's also a bracha that we make, right? So gazing upon the rainbow, what is the deeper meaning? Why did Hashem make the promise on the rainbow will be my promise, right? There's so many other things. Why this ark could be my promise, this mountain that you're on. Why, the, why pick the rainbow? What's the inner significance of that? So the Malbim has an incredible parish, um, crazy parish on this, that the world had never seen a rainbow before the Mabel. There wasn't, this was the first time that they ever saw a rainbow. Azun Chaba never experienced a rainbow, why? So let's be science geeks for a minute. How does, what creates a rainbow? There's a lot of conditions, right? We know that a rainbow happens when it finishes raining. There's water droplets on the floor that refract the, refract the white light from the sun back into the atmosphere and it creates a rainbow in the sky, right? That's the simple science of it. But there's a lot of conditions, the Malbim says, that have to be present for a rainbow to happen because not every time it rains and it's sunny is there a rainbow, right? There has to be very specific conditions to be met for a rainbow to be created. First of all, the sun can't be blocked because you have to have this direct sunlight, the white sunlight, right? So the sun can't be blocked by heavy clouds. So there has to be, the clouds have to be scattered a little bit. The clouds can't be too thick. The water droplets have to be scattered um, so, that they're, so that they can refract the light in a scattered way. And the atmosphere, right, has to be able to um, reflect that back. That's just some of the criteria needed. Now, before the flood came, the world, again, was so physically coarse that the, first of all, it only rained once in 40 years, again, 40, which is cool because it's like every 40 years, there was like a little mikvah kind of thing. And this is what's brought down. And when it rained, the clouds filled the entire sky. They were so thick and coarse and that there was no sunlight, right? They completely covered. And even if they didn't cover the sun, the clouds themselves were so thick. Um, they, the atmosphere also was so thick, it wasn't refined enough. So there was none of the conditions needed that refined atmosphere, the refined clouds, the parting, the delicate water droplets, right? And not only, even if all that was in place, even if there was some scattered, um, there was sunlight and there was a little cloud remaining, right? And there was water droplets on the ground. Still, in order for the rainbow to happen, the water droplets have to absorb the light of the sun and then reflect it back into the atmosphere. And what that represents spiritually was that the water droplets couldn't do that then. They couldn't receive light, they couldn't absorb that light and refract it back because they were too coarse. The water was too coarse to be able to do that before. Only after the flood came and refined the entire world and the earth and all of the um, creation of the world, then they had the capacity to create a rainbow. And that is why when Hashem looked and showed him, this is the rainbow, this is the sign, he's saying, I'll never need to destroy the world again, even if people become corrupted to that point, even if the nation becomes corrupted, because beforehand they didn't have the capacity to do teshuva, right? There was no return for them. And that's why by dunking the world in this, and it actually says something, remind me, anyways, I'm getting a sidetrack, that the, now the people themselves didn't have the ability to absorb light, which is godly light, right? The sun represents the godly light. The people didn't have the ability, they weren't refined enough even if Noah would scream teshuva on their face, even if God spoke to them face to face, they couldn't do teshuva because they were too coarse. They weren't refined enough. It wouldn't penetrate them. That's So they couldn't be penetrated with the light of God and they couldn't reflect it back into the world, which is why we're here, right? To receive light and reflect light back. That's why the first mimer is yehi or. Um, even though the light, no one had any, there was no creations yet to receive the light on the first day of creation. So we ask, why not wait until there was at least fish or something to receive the light? We learned that because light was the entire intention. Really, we say that every single day of creation was a hint of a he or because every morning we're supposed to remember that the entire purpose of Hashem creating the world is that we should be light, that we should let there be light, that we should bring light into the world, that we should be a light in the world, that Hashem created this world that's dark, that's Helem, that conceals God in order that we can reveal light in the world, that we should wake up every day and say, how can I reveal light in, in my space today? Um, and that's why the world begins with by he or. So here Hashem is saying, I'm never going to destroy the world and the rainbow is my sign because the rainbow reminds you that the world inherently is good. That even though we might look at the world and say it's such a dark place, it hides godliness, right? It's so evil, there's so much corruption like right now in the world, there's so much darkness and anti-Semitism and, and scary things going on. And you might just say like, Hashem might just say, why am I even creating a world like this? But the remainder reminds all of us that the world is inherently capable of receiving light and reflecting it back and reflecting that back. And that we, every single creation, even the, even the water droplets, even the earth can now receive light. And the world is inherently now transformed since the mob.